So I think it's very, very important that you have a deep appreciation for your pastor and his wife. And if you do, I'm going to ask you to stand for a moment and just give them a recognition. Would you do that? Just give them a hand of love. Would you do that? We love you guys. Thank you for coming here, for serving. I mean that. Amen. Amen. So why don't you remain standing? We'll read the scripture, and then you can sit down. From first, uh, actually, Second Timothy, chapter one, verse one. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience. As night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith which, I, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice and I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan and to flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline, our sound mind, for civil sake. Let's go back to verse 5. Paul says to the young Timothy, I am reminded of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. Lord, bless this word. Bring it home to us. Help us, Lord, to get the message, to grab hold of it. Let it bless us. Teach us and train us, Lord. I ask your blessing in this word everybody said, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Sometimes I wonder how we can know what we know and be who we are and yet uh, struggle and what's going on. I read this over at uh, Norwalk. I'm going to read it to you again. But when you read the scriptures and what the Bible says about you and about me, this confession states that I am somebody. Romans 8 declares I'm a child of God. Now, how many recognize you are a child of God? You understand that? Uh, you're, you're not just anybody's child. You're a child of God. I'm a joint heir with Christ Jesus as an heir of God. And I'm more than a conqueror through Christ who loves me. If God is for me, who can be against me? How many of you would say this morning, there are some people against me right now? I tell you, when you have that, you've got to remind yourself of whose side you're on and who is with you. That, that's a real key to dealing with life. The 91st Psalm declares, as long as I dwell in the secret place of the Most High, which is the Word of God, I will abide under the shadow, the protection, and the provisions of Almighty God. And it further bears witness in me that God is my refuge, my hiding place, my fortress, my strength, and my God whom I worship. Because of this, I'm not afraid of the snare of the fowler or of noise and pestilence. For a thousand will fall at one side and ten thousand at my right hand, but it shall not come nigh my dwelling. Only with my eyes shall I behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because God is my refuge and my habitation. No evil shall befall me, neither shall plague, sickness, or disease come nigh my dwelling. Why? Because God gives his angels charge over me to keep me in all my ways. And those angels bear me up in their hands before I dash my foot against the stone. 1 Peter 2.9 says, I am a chosen people. I'm a royal priesthood. I'm a holy nation. I'm a peculiar people. I've been called out of darkness and placed in God's light. And Galatians 3 assures me that Christ redeemed me from the curse of the law, and he released me to the blessings of Abraham. It further assures me if I belong to Christ, which I do, then I'm Abraham's seed. Look at your neighbor and say, you're Abraham's seed. Tell him that. That's a very powerful covenant we're talking about. Then I'm Abraham's seed and an heir according to the promises. Some of those promises are found in Deuteronomy 28. I'm blessed coming in. I'm blessed what? Going out. The fruit of my womb, my children, they are blessed. I'm the head, not the tail. I'm above, not beneath. I'm the lender, not the borrower. These blessings overtake me every day. One more thing, the 91st Psalm assures me with long life, will God satisfy me and show me how good it is to be one of the saved. Now, when I read those scriptures and I look at you, I see the convergence of truth there. 
you are the embodiment of everything we just read. God actually read many of those things in Deuteronomy 28 to Israel in the, in the desert. But he kept them through a very challenging time. I believe the church today is the greatest thing on the earth. Not because of doctrine or theology or denominationalism or religious fervor. I believe the church is the one thing that works. Matter of fact, uh, you can prove it if you study it and look around a little bit. The one organization that seems to be grassroots that touches people where they are is the church. And when the church is what God wants it to be, it's very powerful, very effective. Sometimes, you know, we look at this and we wonder about it, but I want you to know you're part of a great event that God has called. He's called you together. You're chosen. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You're a peculiar people. You're formed by the hand of God. It's so, so powerful. So when I look at this, I, I think about my life. And as you get older, Pastor, you begin to think about the timeline, you know. And where I'm at these days, you know, I was, I was uh, you heard some of my story, but I'll touch on it for a second. When I was real young, my mom was a single parent. And she tried to raise me while she worked at bars in Bourbon Street in New Orleans. My father had left. She had me, and, and I remember those early days living up over a bar as she worked downstairs and how much trouble I got in. The house that we lived in was a house of trouble. It had a lot of things went on in that house that were illegal, that were not right, but that's where we lived. And I remember my babysitter, her name was Big Mary, and she, uh, she had tattoos from her neck to her toes. And she was a big girl. She lifted weights for, for exercise and fun in the house. And she ran that house, and she uh, threw the drunks out when they got out of line. She dealt with me as a, a little brat when I was a problem, and she watched after me. And, and I remember running with the street kids around my area. I was learning, even at age five, the language of the streets. We were rolling drunks when they were passed out, going through their pockets, getting their money and their possessions. Uh, we were breaking windows downtown New Orleans, throwing rocks at them for fun. I remember the police caught me. I was running as hard as I could with five-year-old legs. But he just picked me straight up in the air, and my legs were doing just like this. And, and I wasn't the least bit afraid of him or worried about him, but I was really petrified that they would tell Big Mary what I'd done. Because I knew what she would do to me, and just for the record, she did, you know. I got a good disciplining later. But took me down to the precinct with the other kids and called our homes, and we were picked up and disciplined. What I remember next was interesting. My grandmother, a few days later, pulled up at the curb with her car and loaded me in it and my two or three bags of stuff. I didn't have much. But I remember my grandmother put me in that car and saying, boy, you're going home with me. And she drove me from New Orleans to Atlanta, Georgia, where I lived until I went to college. So for the next number of years, I became a Georgia native and, and lived in her house. She had to be in her 40s, about mid-40s at that time. But she knew the best chance for me was not to leave me down on the streets, that my mom was too dysfunctional to really watch after me. So she made the strategic decision to pick up this brat, and that's what I was. I got a whipping every day of school, first, second, and third grade, every day. I was in the principal's office and got a paddling. Back in those days, that's how they disciplined me. Because I was angry and mad and getting in trouble all the time. And until age eight, when the Lord came into my bedroom during the night and woke me up and spoke to me, I knew my grandmother was praying over me, but I had no idea I would warrant or, or be blessed with a personal visit from the Lord himself. But I remember it as clear as day, how he reached over and squeezed my right foot firmly like a dad would and said, go to sleep, you're mine. <clears throat> and I, I just remember the beautiful peace I felt. And so that's what happened to me. And, but what happened was, I was immersed at age five into a church a lot like this. And people like you helped my grandmother, who was in all effect a single parent because her husband was a drug driver and was gone all the time. She took care of me. She raised me. She clothed me. She fed me. She made me go to church. The first morning I tried to sleep in on a Sunday morning. She said, come on, we're going to church. I said, no, ma'am, I'm, I'm going to sleep in today. I just, you know, I don't feel like she said, get your bony butt up. You're going right now. She made me wash and put on clothes and go to church. Not only did we go to church, it was a 45-minute drive to this particular church. 
Not only was it 45 minutes to get there, when we got there, we were the first car in the parking lot. And when we left, believe it or not, we were the last car to leave the parking lot. So I knew I was in trouble right away. And, and so I'm being immersed into another view of life from street life, from prostitution and, and alcoholism and drugs and, and crime, where I was already there quickly. Now I'm being put into a place like this and being taught another code to live by, another belief system. It's not about just take what you can get because it's yours. It's about learn to be a servant leader and to give your life back to people and serve people. It didn't make a bit of sense to me right away. But I went to church, and through the years as a boy to a junior, to a young teen, to a senior teen going into the university where I study, I learned six things I'm going to give you this morning that you need to, you need to recognize and hold them as precious and support it here in what you're doing and be thankful for it. And don't get bored in church. If you get bored in church, that's on you. It's not on anybody else. If we get to where we get to where we're not hearing what the Holy Spirit is saying, or we're critical of leadership because they didn't do something we thought they should do a certain way. You understand people leave churches to go, they hop from church to church to church to church. Because they, they live in the critic seat and, and they too easily uh, go and come improperly. I believe you're here because God has put you here, young and old alike. And I believe you need to stay here as long as God will let you sit in this place and be a part of it and grow with this movement and be a part. And don't just take but learn to contribute and give because it's better to what? Give than receive. Now, I don't know. I always read that and I'm going, really? I don't know if I like that. I mean, I like, I like getting a gift like anybody else. But the Bible actually says you, you've got to learn that it's better giving. Than receiving. When we get that way, things really start happening. So, I've looked back at my life now, and folks, I've done a lot. I've, I've held every position in church you could have. I've been a janitor. I've been a bus driver. Uh, I've taught classes. I've uh, drove the bus. Uh, I've, I've cut the yard. I've cleaned the bathrooms. I've pastored numbers of churches. I've pastored large churches and small churches. I have failed and succeeded in and around this thing we call church. But what I've learned through the struggles of the years is some things I think that we need to pass along. And so these are six things that I learned from my grandmother. And if you read what I read, uh, Paul is about to die in 2 Timothy. They're about to take his life. A tradition says that he wrote this letter that you read, handwritten to Timothy. He saw Timothy as his son, not just son of the Lord, this was a young man he had an affinity with. And if you, if you saw it, he said, it just makes me joyful to see you, even when you're crying. I just, I just miss you. And so he wrote Second Timothy while he was in the holding cell before they beheaded him. Tradition says literally how Rome did that was they put you in a box that was flat, eight foot across, four foot across, four foot high, and they locked you up in this box for a long time, maybe days before they came and took your life, which means he probably scripted this letter while he was in that box. It had a, a view, you know, a little breathing area. We can see it here. And they not only did what they did, they tried to terrorize you before they took your life. So how did Paul deal with his terror as he was finishing his life? He writes Second Timothy to his son in the Lord Timothy. And so when you go back and read through that letter, that book we just read, Remember, this is a dying man about to die writing these intimate thoughts to someone he wanted to, His last will and testament was to say some things to him. Fan in the flame your gift. Don't, don't let what people said about you upset you where you quit functioning. I laid hands on you. The Holy Spirit came and you're gifted. You know what? Everybody in this room is gifted of God. Everybody has a gift in here. But what happens if we don't keep our fire hot, you know, it gets low and we don't do much. As a child, as a teenager, as an adult, as a senior, single, or married, doesn't matter. We're all given a special gift. And you need to do what you do the way you do it, where you do it, why you do it, when you do it, as God has given it to you to perform. Be who you are. It's so important. You know, I'm, I'm 65 now. I'm losing hair on my head. Hair's growing out my nose and out my ears. I don't, I don't understand if this is a joke from God or what, how this works. You know, I got achiness this morning. I had to take pills because of pain in my body with arthritis. I'm going, 
Are you kidding me? It's nothing but the devil trying to slow me down. And you know, you can't stop whatever you're going through. Know that you're gifted of God. And I'm going to tell you why I'm on, on my barrel here talking about this. What, what bothers me about churches the most is that we spend our time doing things we should not be doing in the ministry. We spend way too much time and resources chasing people that don't want to be here. Trying to help people that don't want to be helped. I call it hauling water to the sea. And if I could give you a word from the Lord this morning, it would be stop hauling water to the sea. There's plenty of water in the ocean. Amen? But we spend our time going after people who don't even want to be here anyway. Our people who, who do not have a heart for what God's doing. You need to find the people that deserve you, that want you, that need you, and start hauling water to dry places. There are hurting people around you, and some of them are in your family. Some of them are on your block. Some of them are in your classroom. But, you know, we, we spend all this energy hoping and doing things like hauling water to the sea. Stop hauling water to the sea. Start hauling water to dry hearts and lives. And they're all around you. When you start doing that, this place will fill up just like our sister saw it. It's a shift. People want to come where there's hope and help and love. We know we have it. We just need to give it to the people who need it from us. So I want to challenge you today, as you grow in this ministry, start hauling the waters of God to dry places. Amen? Well, six things I learned. Number one, my grandmother taught me to believe. Now, you got to understand this... This lady I call my grandmother, actually I call her Mama Avery. Everybody know, anybody ever know anybody named Avery? A-R-I-E, raise your hand. It's the strangest name, Avery. But I just called her Mama Avery. That was my nickname for her. She grew up in southern Alabama. Does anybody know where Alabama is? Let me make sure I'm in the right group. I know I'm up north here. Down south, I mean that's down in Coffee County, Alabama, below Dothan. Uh, down in the deep south. That's where she grew up as a little girl. And back in the uh, Depression, when she grew up as a little girl, there wasn't anything. They didn't have food. They uh, didn't have money. She, I'd hear her talk about Christmas. This is where she got in a sock that had been sewed together a walnut, an orange, and an apple, maybe a piece of candy. That was Christmas. That was it. And they were glad to get that. They grew up eating pone bread, P-O-N-E. Does anybody know what pone bread is? Pone bread is a poor man's bread that's made out of flour. A little water and flour, and you make it. It's about that thin like a big pancake. It gets real hard on the outside. And she learned to grow up living simple places. So her worldview, she grew up with a very simplistic look at the world, out of poverty, out of nothing. When she married, she didn't even have a dress to get married in. Her mother gave her her only cotton dress to wear at her wedding, which was on a dirt floor in a building. And so when they started, she and my grandma, grandfather married. Uh, that was very, very simple. I want you to know the person who I learned these things from. And so she had a lot of things to overcome. Her life was a mess. wasn't going that well. Uh, she and my grandfather were on the verge of separating and divorcing a couple of times. But she went to a Billy Graham crusade. Somehow, somebody like you invited her to a gospel tent. And she went and heard for the first time in her life, dysfunctional as it was, she heard the message that God so loved the world. He so loved everybody, he gave his son. And whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Now you may be bored with those words, <clears throat> but those words are words of life to somebody out there that doesn't get it. Whoever's writing these gang insignias on these buildings and vehicles, they need to hear that message. They don't get it. They think life is in the gang. They think their future is in crime. You don't understand. You have what people need, and we've got to figure out how to live in a way outside this room that we take it to them. <clears throat> so my grandmother found Jesus as a middle-aged woman. She had a conversion. Old things, what? Passed away. All things became... The problem with her was she was a stubborn southern woman that was very black and white. And when she found the Lord, she just thought everybody should know. And so I got to where I wouldn't take any of my friends to my house because I knew she'd preach to them. I mean, I watched. But when she died, when I did her funeral some years back, she was 97 years old, healthy. She only died for one reason. She got mad and quit eating. And she decided, I'm going to heaven whether you want me to or not. One way I know I can do it is just don't eat. 
And uh, I drove down to the hospital in Atlanta and got on to her and said, who do you think you are playing God and doing all this stuff? And I got her to eat uh, a banana that day. And then I said, what else do you want? She said, pork rinds. Well, I don't know if you ever tried it, but you go around a city like Atlanta trying to find a bag of pork rinds. It's not that easy. It took me an hour to find a big bag of those. Brought it back, and we sat, I sat there, and she ate every stinking pork rind. I made her eat them all. And so uh, then I gave her the coach talk and left and went back to my pastorate, and she quit eating the moment I walked out the door. She went back to plan A. Two weeks later, she was with the Lord. So, But she lived a healthy, blessed life, and I watched her go through life, grew up in her house. She had a very clear view of truth, right and wrong, something we could use in our thinking today as believers. But what I learned from her was to have a belief system. And, and I found that she believed in the scriptures as real. She didn't, she didn't think anything compared to the Bible. Her, the Bible was something she believed in. You need to do that too, and you need to authenticate what you believe about the scripture. She believed in God. She didn't believe there was more than one God. There may be other people calling themselves gods. But she knew there was one true God, the Hebrew God, Yahweh. She believed in the church. She saw the church as a way that God got people together as different as we are and put something together. Uh, she believed God has a plan for everybody. I didn't know that until I was a teenager. But she believed in a plan of God for everybody. And she believed in overcoming problems in your life. I watched her do that. Now her family, all of her family, she was one of ten children and all of her brothers and sisters were real hellions. They were, they were crazy people. I'm telling you, they were nuts. Um, I, I watched all kinds of stories around her. She was the first believer in her whole family tree. When she died a few years ago at 97, every family member is a born-again believer because of her. Of course, they stayed mad at her for a long time. Many years, some of them wouldn't, but she made sure. She had compassion for them. She told them, you need to ask God in your life, you need Jesus if you keep living like this, you're going to lose every time. She just never, she loved them, but she was very clear. And she did that because she had a conviction that she believed in something. We need in the church today to have a clear code of belief. Not gray, but, but clear. There's one true God. There's one Savior. The Bible is the written Word of God inspired. We need to believe in divine healing. We need to believe in the resurrection from the dead and the coming of the Lord. We need to believe, not like Muslims, but as Christians, there is a heaven waiting for us. You know, in the Muslim religion, there is no heaven. It's all about now the way they do what they do. Go study the Koran. Uh, we, have, we have a promise. We have a message that we can give people that somehow, some way, God will. That's what I heard from my grandmother. She was a very simple girl, very ordinary. Uh, she grew up on a farm, you know. She always had a cake of cornbread. I'll make you hungry now. She kept a pot of peas on the stove and and, and always uh, cooked up good meal, but she's a very simple lady. So her happiness was not based on having a TV in every room and, and having the things. Right. She was just very basic in that way. But she was happy, and she believed what she believed. And so I started, you know, growing up on the streets where I was taught to steal and, and rob and all that type of stuff. Now I'm coming to a place like this hearing there's another way to live. And I heard the teachings in Sunday school class and the sermons from the pastor and the songs that they sang. And I began to go, well, there is another way to look at life. And the church that I attended in Atlanta back in the 60s was about 2,000 people on a Sunday night. Morning was about 1,000 to 1,500. But Sunday night, the place was packed out. And it was, it was, a, it was a rocking place. They, they loved the Lord. It was an interesting place, the Assembly of God Tabernacle in Atlanta. I learned from her how to believe in something. You see, Paul said, I see something that started in your grandmother. And it was passed to your mother. And now, Timothy, I see it in you. I want to say to this church, your best work is not just about right here. It's passing truth and holiness from generation to generation to generation. You know how that's done? Not in sermons and songs. It's done in the way you live your life. If it works for you, if you really are sick and you're healed, if you really lost a job, you pray a job in. You know, your, your family, your neighbors are watching your life. And they're watching how, you know, I just want to say it. Bad things happen to good people. How else would you want me to say it? Bad things happen to good people. The Bible does not promise you a painless experience. 
but the Lord has promised us Old and New Testament that if we believe in Him and follow Him, He will walk with us through the fire, through the flood, through the damages. <clears throat> Most of the time, He's not going to take you away from what you ask Him to take you away from. He's going to take you through it and walk with you so that you learn some stuff so that later you know how to stand when others run and you know how to hold your ground when others have no backbone. That was my grandmother. She was a mean old Alabama girl. And, and, but right was right to her. She didn't care if she offended you. She didn't care if you liked her. She just she cared for you. She wanted to see you go to heaven. And she made sure that she told you what she knew and what the Lord had done for her. Her favorite song was, Oh, How I Love Jesus. I must have heard that song a thousand times. Second thing I learned from her was how to pray. Not only did I learn from her as a, a brat growing up in her little home there south of Atlanta, but I found out she prayed all the time. It didn't mean she was perfect. I'm not going to tell you she never said something she shouldn't have said. That she didn't get mad sometimes. But she didn't lose it occasionally. Oh, yeah. She was a human being. But the one thing I watched in her was she prayed about everything all the time. Just for the record, did you ask? Did you ask before you bought a car? Did you ask before you sold your house? Did you ask before you picked a school? Did you ask before you do what you do? We do so many things that we never consult God whatsoever. We just think we can just roam around free and do what we do, and you get yourself in a lot of trouble. If you will learn to ask God in everything, it'll save you a boatload of pain. It'll bless you. And you need to learn. And I watched her do it. And I used to go, why do you talk to God about that? You know, she asked God about everything. And I watched how God blessed her life. And it taught me important how prayer is. The old phone, I think I told you this when I was here last, it would ring every night. Back in those days, they had the old black phone, you know. And uh, my mom would call in drunk somewhere every night. My grandmother would answer the phone, cry over her, talk with her, pray with her on the phone. She'd hang the phone up. I laid in bed and heard it every night. This went on for years. She'd go into the living room. She'd pray over my mother. And I'll be honest with you, for years I thought, that's a prayer God's not going to answer. She's too messed up. She's beyond help. But the truth is, in 1972, when I was called from college to go to my mother's bedside, at Grady Memorial Hospital, I walked into a, a room where my mother was in a traumatic care unit. She had 72 hours to live with terminal cancer. And my grandmother had prayed for her every night in her alcoholism for years. I walked in, and I had the, ch the chance to lead my mom to Jesus. And she prayed and accepted the Lord. And I remember sending a message back to the devil saying, you might get her body, but you will not get her soul. She's born again now. She's God's property. Got to the door, and the Holy Spirit, and I'd learned this being in this church around people like you, to hear. And the Spirit said, go back and pray for her healing. I went, ah, yeah. So here she is. The cancer's running into a bag. It's a very hideous scene. She's dying. And I, I said, Mom, by the way, Jesus can heal you. And how many believes Jesus can heal? I want to make sure I'm in the right church this morning. I want you to know, He can heal anything. And I said, it's like this, Mom. He's either going to take you home, keep you comfortable till you go to heaven, or He's going to totally heal you from this cancer. I was just, I was 17 years old then. No, 18 years old, excuse me. I didn't know any better. I just believed, I'd seen it. I had been in this church and watched people come to the altar and watch them healed. I'd seen people push their wheelchair out of the church on some Sunday services. I'd seen people walk out carrying their crutches because God healed a broken bone. I saw blinded eyes see at the altars of that church. I heard bones snap one Sunday. That put the fear of God in me. When they prayed, their bones snapped into place. Strange power in that place. Because these people, they just believe God. And so here I'm going, well, let's just give mom a go here, Lord. And I prayed a very simple prayer. This is my mom. Heal her in Jesus' name. Either take her to heaven with no more pain or make her body well so she can live for you the rest of her days. Amen. I didn't change my voice. I didn't change my tonation. I didn't try to get dramatic. I just blessed my mom with a prayer of healing, which is what you need to do. Make sure God gets the credit. And I walked out and went to the waiting room and they were collecting money for her, her funeral. Will you put 50 on the casket? Yeah. Will you put 25 on the burial site? Yeah. And I said, what are y'all doing? They said, oh, we're making plans for Mary. I said, my God, they'll never come to see me in a hospital. You're, you're going to bury me before I'm gone. 
And I got mad at him. I said, I won't, I won't give you any money. I'll have nothing to do with this. And I went back to school, left in God's hands. And uh, God healed my mother. She came out of that hospital a month later, totally healed. And I believe the reason she was healed, not simply because Jesus suffered and died for her and rose again, yes. But my grandmother employed prayers nightly over her daughter. And those prayers that God collects caught up with her on her deathbed and performed the miracle for her. And my mom, I just laid her to rest a couple of years ago. She died at 87. And she would look at you. I never thought that lady would see 80, the life she lived. But she would hold that crooked finger out. She'd go, you, you got to believe. That's what she'd say. You got to believe. And uh, she, you know, I saw from my grandmother to my mother to me. Now I have a son and I have grandkids. And we all believe five generations of faith there because from the grandmother to the daughter to the son. So that's the power of the church right there. Now, so you got to believe, and you, and you got to learn how to pray. And my grandmother prayed in the Holy Spirit. She spoke in tongues, but it was just a phrase. She never got beyond a phrase. I think I told Pastor that. And for her, I mean, I remember her going to be prayed for. She received the baptism of the Spirit, and she had one phrase that she would pray when the Spirit came on her. That's how she lived and prayed that in the Lord. She prayed about her life in Jesus. I discovered, I learned from my grandmother how to believe and how to pray. And I'm telling you, your children need to see you pray. They need to hear you pray. They need to pray with you. They need to experiment and experience prayer around your lifestyle so that they figure out how it works, the ins and outs of it. That's what happened to me. The third thing that happened was I learned from my grandmother, Avery Fleming, how to serve. And she was a faithful person. She was always helping other people. Uh, she made sure early on that she made me serve, whether I wanted to or not. She made sure I got to church, that I was in Sunday school, even when I didn't want to go. She took me to church. She put me in Royal Rangers, where in the boys' program I learned how to box. It's the only time I could hit someone legally and get away with it. But it was really fun. We had gloves and in the boys' program. Man, we got outdoors and we boxed and had bloody noses and welts on our head and laughing and having fun as boys. I know some of you are looking at me like, what? Yeah, yeah, guys, we're like that. We, we, need, we need stuff like that. And I learned in, in Royal Rangers, you know, how to camp and how to start a fire and how to do all that. It was the church that started doing My dad did not want me. My dad was killed by the mafia and buried in Potter's Field in New Orleans. I didn't have a father. But the men of the church became my extended family and they adopted me, and they made sure that I learned basic things young men need to learn. And when I was bad, they helped my grandmother hold me in line. Uh, that's, that's what the church provided for me. But I learned through her how to serve, how to go to camp, how to be in rangers, how to be in youth group. I learned I was in the choir. I, I sang in the youth choir. I didn't want to sing in the youth choir, but she made me. and Just did it because it was what we did. And then I learned, uh, she made sure I took piano lessons, and I started learning music. The church we were in was a huge church. It had an 80, 90 voice choir, a full orchestra left and right. Every instrument you could imagine was on the platform. It was the place to go on Sunday nights in Atlanta. People came from everywhere. Believe it or not, as I began to take basic music lessons in church, there came a Sunday, this church had a way of taking their children and saying, we really believe in you. And they asked me to play for the offertory on a Sunday night. I remember as clear as day, I was about 12 years old. I sat down at this black grand piano, and I looked out, and there were 2,000 people looking at me, Pastor. And I just froze. And I had memorized the song. I was going to play some hymn or something, you know. And when I looked at all the people, I was just not there anymore. I was stage frozen. And they said, Amen. I realized there was a moment of truth, and I could not remember the title nor the song I had memorized. The only song that I could remember was Alley Cat. So I played Alley Cat. That's the best I could do. And I offered Alley Cat. I had to play through it twice for them to take up that offering because it was a large church. And I noticed they were just kind of sending the plate, you know, and having fun. And I got done, and I just got up and, and almost ran off the platform. I was petrified. This church had a way of taking our youth and our children and training us about performance and giving us opportunities. When I got done, everybody stood and clapped. I couldn't believe it. Alley cat. But that church affirmed us like you do. These children and the youth, they need to know they have a place 
at the table, that their gift is important. And I learned early on how to serve through her. And, and so I learned being a servant leader through my grandmother. She was always doing it. She made sure I did it. The fourth thing I learned was tithing. Oh, I, I, you know, I never get amens on this one, but you know, th this is the most critical piece of what you need to learn in this church. I'm going to be as honest as I know how to be with you. You can't make it on your own. You cannot live on 100% of what you bring in and be successful like when you live on 90% of what you bring in and give God that 10%, not that God needs your 10 But you need to know that He's the provider all the time. God is good when? And all the time God is... And I'm telling you, when it comes to tithing, uh, my grandmother taught me to take a dime from every dollar, a dollar from every 10, a 10 from every 100. And she made me write out that tithing envelope and put it in the church. I learned that as a boy on. And I watched how God provided. I remember when I was first tested in church, I was dating the most beautiful girl in the world until I met my wife later, obviously. But as a young 16-year-old boy, I'd finally gotten a date with this girl who was a cheerleader at the high school. And I loved my church in those days. You would see me drive into the parking lot of my church with a carload of teenagers. I mean, I love my church. I want everybody to see and believe what I was a part of. And I think she was Presbyterian. And I took her, I figured a Sunday night would be a safer service. So I took her on a Sunday night, and we sat somewhere right back here. And uh, I had $5. Now, $5 in your pocket in 1960, in the 60s, was good money. And the problem is Jeanette Decker, a missionary from the Indian Reservation, came at the offering time, started crying tears about how bad the Indians were being treated and how they're starving to death. And the people were wiping tears, and they took up the offering for Jeanette Decker for these Indians. And I'm going, oh, great. You know, here's the Holy Spirit now. And, and God's telling me, I, this is what I'm hearing, put your $5 in the offering plate. And I'm, I'm really torn as a teenager. Here's this girl that I want to take out after church. If I put the $5 in, we didn't have credit cards back in those days. And I'm, I'm going, God and this girl, God, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Here comes the offering plate. And I remember my heart was beating and I'm under conviction. I, and I was not a joyful giver, but I took the $5 out and put it in the plate and there it went down the road. And then all I can remember after that was I'm trying to think of a real good excuse to give her why I cannot take her out. You know, I really wanted to impress her. But I was more concerned ultimately than, than honoring the Lord. See, I learned that here. It's a hard choice. But I was so embarrassed. So the service was over. We went to the car. I drove a 1962 white and Palace Chevrolet in that time. Opened the door for her. She said, I went around, went to get in the car. I saw something under the car, and I looked. And on the ground was a crumpled up $5 bill wow. under the car. I'll never forget it. And, and she never knew anything about it. I reached down and took it and put it in my I said, thank you, God. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> But I got it, and I could take her out tonight. And, you know, had that not have happened, it wouldn't have changed the outcome. Uh, but you, this is a living experiment in here of how it works. Sometimes, hallelujah, sometimes praise the Lord. Sometimes gently singing in one accord. But these youth are learning through us the model of how it works. And we pass along generation to generation to generation. I learned to tithe, and I can tell you today, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. And I've never seen their seed beg for bread. If you're faithful in those things, if you honor the Lord with your first fruit, He will take care of you. He will see to it. Somehow, my grandmother said, say it with me, somehow, some way, God will. And I'll watch that little cotton-dressed lady from Alabama live that 97 years. Uh, the fifth thing I learned through her was missions. Not only did she believe in sending missionaries, giving the missions. She uh, trained me in the church as a missionary. She made sure I got in the programs where they taught me how to give my testimony. So I became a young teenager. And the group I was in in the church, we went out to McDonald's, grabbed a quick bite, went to Grant Park and met people and talked to them about God and Christ. And she made sure I was in things that taught me how to verbalize what I believed, how to pray with people publicly how to respond to their needs, and uh, to learn the Great Commission, responding to the call. I'm glad I grew up in a church that didn't just focus on here, but also focused on out there. 
And I love it, Pastor, when I see these nations represented here. That's indicative of the, of the heart of this leader, this wife, and of the leadership of this church. This is a safe place to touch the world through. You can know when you put money in missions here, it's going to go to the right place properly. It's not going to be wasted. Uh, it's serious what they do when they support missions. And I'm glad I learned it wasn't just about me or just about my church. It was about us, us in the community of the world. And I've, I've been blessed enough now to travel the world. I'm 65 years old. I've been pretty much all over the world. I've watched God do miracles and healings everywhere, China, Africa, South America, Mexico, the islands. Uh, it's an amazing thing to see this gospel, how it's great from nation to nation. Missions is huge. The final thing I'm going to share with you, not only did uh, I go live in a house where my grandmother raised me, as I told you, but she was a worshiper. She liked Lawrence Welk. I hated Lawrence Welk. i would be honest with you. Oh, I had to sit watching Lawrence Welk. I don't know. How many knows who Lawrence Welk is? She loved good music. And, and we were just fortunate, like your church, to have good singers and good music. She loved good music and good worship. Not only did she like to hear it, she loved to sing it. And I, I have so many memories of her being in the yard around the house. I could hear my grandmother singing that hymn that was in her mind or heart or that chorus. And uh, I learned from her. Worship is not just a song service. It's not just an arrangement. It's, it's a lifestyle. It's something that's flowing through you 24-7. And I watched her model it, and sure enough, as I grew from a boy to a teen to a young man, worship became a part of my life. The thing I want to talk about here for a moment with worship is not just the songs and the hymns and the spiritual songs, but I want to talk about just for a moment that worship is about the transformation of people, their home life, their church life, and their public life. And what bothers me is many times we come into churches, I don't care if you've had the worst time in your life, you need to get up on your feet and clap your hands. You need to, you, need to, you know, we can shake our booty to the rhythm of the world, and we do. Shame on you if you can't do that for God. You know, you think it's not cool? There are seven Hebrew words about worship because God chose the Jew, and they knew they were set apart. They created seven expressions of saying, thank you, God. And we learn our worship from the Jew. Our, our worship comes out of those seven words. Even one of them is a spinning wildly in the dance. And if you go over there, they do. And they're, they're not faking it. They're, they're serious about celebrating life in God. The church has lost its song. We've got to go back and find our song again, our expression. And it'll be different for all of us. But there's some song, some hymn, some sound we, we need to enter in, and what I, what I remember to this day is 2,000 people singing so loud it would make your ears ring. And, they, and they, weren't, they weren't in a hurry. They started at 6, and you might get out 11 or 12 o'clock on a Sunday day. And we didn't hurry, God. We just waited on the Lord. It was the most cool thing to do was to be in this place and watch people get healed, get saved, get filled with the presence of God by His Spirit. It happened every service. It needs to happen every service for us. And so <clears throat> there were things interesting about us. There was one guy that sat right here with my brother with that cool shirt. If you get tired of that shirt, just we'll take it from you. But his name was Bill Prather. And Bill Prather was an Indian, and he killed a man. And he was on death row right down Boulevard at the end of it. Five blocks down was the, the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary. And he was in that place on death row. He was months away from being electrocuted. Somehow a preacher got in there and got to him, and he found Jesus as his personal Savior. Not only did he find Jesus, he got born again, and he got free. They let the man out of prison. Now, I don't know that story. All I know is he came out. So when he's sitting there, and we're singing, Once Like a Bird from Prison Bars, I Flew. You start singing, He Set Me Free. You know, I'll fly away. He sent me free some of those songs. Prather, he's six foot six. He was a tall boy. Dark skin, black hair. Curly. He'd get up, he'd go, glory to God! And if you weren't there, you know, who, what, who, what? He'd hit that center round. He did. You ever see these sumo wrestlers? 
You know the big guys. You know who I'm talking about? If you go to wrestle them, they do this. They, they get down like this. And they're like this and this, and they're looking at you like this. And you know if they come at you, you better get out of the way because they're going to knock you over. Prather, he would get to shaking his head, and he did what I called the holy stomp. And he'd get out there like this, and they're in the center of 2,000 people. He's going, oh, God, I'm free. Oh, God, tears run out of his eyes. He'd go up and down that aisle, shaking his head, stomping. Tears run out of his eyes. And, and looking at the audience and going, praise God. Well, now we do that at baseball games, football games, but we don't do it in church. Well, that's too bad. Because you need to worship your life, your experience, if he saved you, if he healed you. You need to find ways. I watched in my time in that church from five years old to 17 when I went to college, almost 18. I watched people like you get transformed transform. Things came at them. They went through things, good and bad. But the word was true, what they believed, how they prayed, what they experienced, uh, what they did. And the worship brought it all together. Every time the worship was the catalyst for us all sharing together the message. I love hearing parents sing over their babies. I love watching families stand and worship together. Something we need to do more of. You know, what is your song of worship today? What, what is your affinity as a believer? What song resonates in you? If you can't think of one, then you need to ask the Lord, what's my song? Come on, Holy Spirit, show me in my soul where the message is. I'm so tired of churches trying to evolve around pretty music and good words. We need to hear from you. You're the worship, not that. Not the keyboard. The instruments are nice. The vocals are... You're the song. It's your life song. It's what you're all about. It's that he brought you through the Red Sea and the horse and the rider he threw into the sea. How do you think those Jews behaved on the other shore? You think they were going, oh, praise God. <laughs> praise God. No, man, they were partying. They, they were dancing. They had the tambourines, the horse and his rider he threw into the sea. You know, you got a song of deliverance here. You got a song of salvation. You got a song of promise. You got a song about heaven. You need to get your songs together and start entering in and, and, and forget what people think. Because we want to worship too, and you can help us get free by doing it. I just grew up in a place that just did that. And the altar calls, man, uh, this church just had a way of welcoming people. They could put up an alley cat for an offering, they could do anything, I imagine. But you felt connected there. And when the altars were open, people waited on the Lord until they got what they needed, and only then did they get up. Now, my grandmother sat right here in the church, center aisle, right there. And uh, she did that for decades. And the truth is, if you sat in her seat, she'd walk up to you and go, <clears throat> that's my seat. And you'd probably say, Joe, well, there's other seats. She'd say, no, that's my seat. You need to move. That's my place. And she was serious about, in so many ways, her seat. But it wasn't about the seat. It was about how she felt about the connection to the place. I always walked away. She embarrassed me. We saw her move more than one person out of her seat. But I learned through her, not perfection, but I learned the things that matter. See, that's what this is all about here today. It's not about, is the sermon perfect or the song's right? Is the temperature? Those are important things. But what, it, what it's all about is us being together in one place, in one accord, for one purpose, being many members yet one body. What did Jesus pray in John 17? Father, I pray that they might be one. As you and I are one, I'm in you, you're in me, I pray for them to be in us, and us to be in them that they are one. I want you to stand this morning. I want to pray with you. I learned through my grandmother, so did Timothy. Timothy was a product of his family, Eunice and Lois. I don't know what happened to the men there. It didn't, it didn't mention them. I really don't know that answer. But thank God for single mothers and grandmothers that raise kids. Thank God for churches that, that, that have an interest in kids without a dad. I never felt like a, an orphan there. 
I wore your hand-me-down clothes. I never lacked in clothing. Mine not, not, might not have been new, but I always... I remember when Ricky Freeman gave me his leather jacket. Man. I felt like the Fonz. I put that thing on. I was so cool. You know, life is just good. I want to pray for your community here this morning. I want to pray over you. I want to pray the Holy Spirit gives you dreams and visions and urges. I want to release worship in this house in you, young and old alike, that, that you can't get it out of your mind, your soul, that song that's stuck in my mind. And for days it's ministering to you uh, that you begin to find your expressions of celebrating the Lord in your life. I think that's critical. There needs to be a transformation from generation to generation the generation. <clears throat> so, I'm going to ask this as I'm going to ask this as a personal savior. Come and stand with me, and I'm going to speak a blessing over you. Would you do that? Just, just gather right here. If you have your children, bring them with you. Would you stand right here, and I'm going to, I'm going to pray over you. What I would give to hear my grandmother's knees hit that wooden floor again. You are somebody. You're very special. I know we're not perfect. Sometimes we get it right. It's really nice when things really line up. But how's the church when things aren't going so good? When you lose your job. Or the doctor says you got a disease you got to deal with, or a loved one dies. Been through all those, doesn't change the truth. We're just on a journey. And I want to encourage the parents here to stay the course. I know sometimes your kids can press you to where you wonder. I want to say to the sons and daughters here love the Lord and love your parents, pray for them. And stick together. Never give up on each other. Never give up. I don't know how my grandmother did. She got me through school. Got me into college. I watched her for decades. Love the Lord. Never changed for her. When she passed away, her house was paid for. Her car was paid for. She had plenty of clothes. She left one cake of cornbread on the table. Uh, when I packed her house up, I found a few thousand dollars hidden away on top of the little bank account she had. She tithed. She, you know, the things I talked about, believing, praying, serving, tithing, missions, revival and worship. By the way, when we had revivals back then, we were there every night. We were the 